Well, welcome again. It's Thursday night. A couple of Thursday nights have gone by. And uh, we are in Daniel chapter 7. And we will go through verses 15 through 25 this evening. And this is teaching number 20. The story is told of a king who was looking for satisfaction in his life. His advisors told him that if he could wear the shirt of a contented man for just a day, he would be cured of his discontentment. His servants searched the kingdom for a content man so that they could bring the shirt to the king, but they returned empty-handed. The king was furious. In response, the men told the king, we found a contented man, but he doesn't own a shirt. We live in a world that is grasping for contentment. Pastor Ray Stedman said, contentment is not having all that you want. True contentment is wanting only what you have. The Apostle Paul was very content, but it wasn't something that came naturally to him. Twice he tells us in Philippians that he had to learn to be content. Contentment is an intentional choice. There are two ways in which we can be content. One is to continue to accumulate more and more, or one can desire less. Contentment is something we choose. Paul was called to suffer for Christ. He didn't have a charmed life. A matter of fact, he was in a Roman prison when he wrote these words, I have learned to be content in every situation. Paul's contentment didn't result from his life circumstances. He was content because of Christ. When he faced difficulties, he responded to live is, is Christ and to die is gain. Even in the face of death, he was content. Paul's secret of contentment was that he found contentment through Christ who gave him strength. Regardless of our circumstances, may we turn to him and experience this same confidence. In Jesus, we can be content because we have all that we need. Today, we're going to look at the interpretation of Daniel's dream. It speaks of a world system that's anti-Christ, and part of that system is materialism. It's a tool of the enemy that he's going to use in these last days to weaken us. His strategy is that if we're discontent with what the Lord is providing, maybe we will sell our souls for our material desires. But as time progresses and the Antichrist comes in to reign, we're going to want and desire these material things and they're going to be the things of necessity. They're going to be things like food and water. So we need to learn to be content now so that if we have to face that choice, we will choose Christ just as Paul did. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. We thank you for your word, Father. I just pray that you would feed our spirits, Lord, from heaven, that you would teach us this evening, that you would open your word and open our understanding to your word, Father. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start to read at Daniel 7.15. It says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by, and I asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings with, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with his feet. And the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth, which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, 
And the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change the times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half of time. Daniel sees this vision and it is so horrifying to him that he is so troubled, he says, I'm troubled in my spirit. Now this is scary to us to read this, but can you imagine Daniel actually was seeing this in his mind? And it was hard for him to comprehend exactly what was going on, but one thing he knew, he knew it was dark, it was evil, and it grieved his spirit. It's really interesting. I like that Daniel states that he was grieved in his spirit within his body. This confirms to us that our spirit is within our body. And not only that, but it shows us that there is some type of connection between our spirit and our physical bodies. So what Daniel does at first is he's kind of like going over a summary of what he actually saw. And... Um, I love that it says that those great beasts, which are four kings, will arise out of the earth. And then immediately after that, it says, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. We win. God wanted Daniel to know right up front, you're seeing all this evil, but I am going to win. The saints are going to win. We have the victory. And he wanted Daniel to know that right away because he knew how troubled Daniel was going to be in seeing this vision. So these beasts are going to rise out of the earth. And I think God uses this picture of these wild beasts because beasts are wicked, ferocious. They're wild. They devour. They conquer. And they do it without a conscience. So he's telling us something about these kings that are going to rise up out of the world out of the earth they are going to be like wild animals they are going to have no heart they're going to have no conscience so daniel sees this world empire that is yet to come and the reason that i believe that it's yet to come is because the next verse that we see has not been fulfilled yet right it says but the saints of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever even forever and ever i don't see us saints possessing this world I see that Satan is still at work in this worldly kingdom. It spoke that way in the book of Revelation. It spoke that way in the book of Isaiah and in the prophets. It tells us that when the saints um, are going to be giving the world, given the world, they are going to be a transformed people in a transformed world. Remember the new heaven and the new earth. When the day of the fourth beast is over, then God's people receive his kingdom. There are those that do believe that this scripture has been fulfilled already. And to them, what they do with this scripture is they spiritualize it. They say when Jesus first came to the earth, he brought his kingdom to the earth, and now his kingdom resides in us, so this has been fulfilled. But how could it be fulfilled if... You cannot spiritualize the rest of the scriptures that talk about a literal reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. When it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. When it talks about Satan and all evil being destroyed upon the earth. How can you spiritualize that? Those things did not happen. So I truly believe that this is a future picture of what God is going to do. God is going to rid the world of the Antichrist, of Satan, and of all evil the evil and then he will fulfill what this says that the saints of the most high will receive the kingdom and it is an everlasting kingdom 
And that's going to happen at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now Daniel is, is, is honing in specifically on this fourth beast. This fourth beast is what is troubling him. This fourth beast with the ten horns, and it's got these teeth and these nails, and, it, and it's just going around, and it's just destroying everything in its past, in its path. In Daniel's vision, we know that the little horn represents the final evil world leader. This is the Antichrist in his final days in his earthly kingdom, and this does belong to the future. Therefore, because it belongs to the future, we really don't know where he's coming from. There are many that identify him as coming from Rome, and we know that in the past, there have been leaders that have come from Rome. But that doesn't mean that's what the future holds. He could be rising out of a place like the Middle East. He can be rising out of Islam. Remember when we studied in the book of Revelation, we looked at the Antichrist and how he could come out of the Middle East. So I'm just going to summarize that really quickly. If you remember when we studied the book of Revelation, we learned about a revived empire, that there would be a revived empire, and that's why many people think that it is Rome, because it is the Roman army that destroyed the temple in 70 AD. But what we did learn is at that point in history, in 70 AD, the Roman army was not made up of Roman citizens, but it was made up of hired Arabs out of the Middle East. So it very well could be that the Antichrist comes out of the Middle East. The other thing is, is because it is a revived empire, the only empire that really fulfills the requirements that we see in Daniel 2, that we see in Daniel 7, that we see in Revelation chapter 13, is an empire that is so completely evil and crushing. That's, that's, the, that's the trait of this empire. It's crushing. It destroys everything in its path. The Roman Empire never did that. The Roman Empire never crushed, crushed the culture of the people that they conquered. The Roman Empire allowed Judaism to continue. It allowed Christianity to continue. But the caliphate, anywhere that they go, they crush the culture that was there before them. There will be left no evidence of that culture wherever the caliphate goes. So it very well could be that the Antichrist comes out of the Middle East. Also, in Revelation 17, we learn that the Antichrist could possibly um, come out of the Islamic caliphate because it was actually an empire that existed after the Roman Empire. It is one of the last empires. And it existed and dominated in 632 to 750 AD. Then it was weakened. But as we can see, it's beginning to rise again. By 2050, the number of Muslims will nearly equal the number of Christians around the world. According to a Pew Research uh, study, by 2015, there will be 2.8 billion muscle, Muslims, and that is 30% of the world's population. There will be 2.9 um, billion Christians, and that's 31% of the world's population. What's interesting about that is they're finding that the rate of births in both um, religions are different. The Muslims have many more children, so they are going to go above the Christians very quickly after 2050. The other thing that um, I think is important that we should look at that the Antichrist could possibly come out of um, the Middle East is because of Gog and Magog that we see in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. You see, Gog of Magog is the Antichrist. That's who that is. And um, it talks about in, in Ezekiel, in those two chapters, it gives us details about an invasion 
of Israel in the last days. And it is led by a man called Gog. Very commonly, it's interpreted that Gog will come out of Russia, that it will be a Russia, Russian ruler who attacks Israel. Instead, I believe that it could be that this person is not from Russia, but from the Middle East. Um, and this is why I think that, is that there are um, a lot of likenesses between the Gog War and Armageddon. First of all, God calls Gog the Antichrist in Ezekiel 38:17 when he says, Are you not the one I spoke of in former days? This is in a reference to the Antichrist. Um, and the similarities in the Gog battle and the Armageddon battle is that both Gog and the Antichrist are destroyed by an earthquake. Both armies are stricken by plagues. Both armies turn on themselves at the last hour. And in both instances, there is a call for animals to come and feast on God's enemies. So they're very, very similar, and they could possibly be the same war. The other reason that I believe that um, the Antichrist could come out of um, the Middle East is because both Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 11 imply that the Antichrist is coming out of the Middle East, which we're going to look at, of course, in future teachings because we're going to go into Daniel 8 and 11. All of this to say that we need to remain open to the plan of God, we need to be alert, we need to stay watchful, and we need to be awake. Because we don't know where this Antichrist is coming. So Daniel sees this little horn coming up among these ten horns. This fact shows us that there will be other Antichrist with the same characteristics as the Antichrist. These antichrists have gone before. We've seen uh, foreshadows of them as tyrannical dictators, and they've stepped on the world stages at different periods of our history. Matter of fact, 1 John tells us in chapter 2, verse 18, he says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the antichrist is coming, even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. So the sign that we're in the last hour is that antichrists will come. And we've seen them. We've seen them in Hitler and Mussolini. Um, but this antichrist will be different than all the others. He will be the apex of evil. We can't really specifically identify him. What we ought to do is hold our interpretation loosely so we're ready for any surprises that happen. What we need to look at, is, at more than from where he is coming, we need to look at the character of the person so we can identify him when we see him. We're told by God that there are um, three specific things that he's going to do against God. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to blaspheme God. The second thing he's going to do is he's going to come against the people of God. That means the church and the nation of Israel. And he is going to oppose everything connected with God. We know that it's not going to be that way at first. At first, he's going to be so open and he's going to welcome all religions until he gets into power. And then he's going to turn against religion. He is going to take our freedom of religion away and he is going to bring in his own idolatrous system. Daniel says this in verse 21, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of most high and a time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So it says that this horn, this Antichrist, is going to make war against the saints. And this is one of the reasons why I don't believe that the pre-trib and the mid-trib theory is correct. Because notice what it says here. There's a fluid exchange between the time when the Antichrist is going to make war against the saints and then they're going to receive the kingdom. There's this fluidness that is happening. 
we will receive the kingdom upon the return of Christ. That's when Christ says we will, and that's when the church will be raptured. It also says here, particularly, it says that he made war against the saints. Who are the saints? It's described in Revelation chapter 12 and 13. In Revelation 12, 17, it says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's who the saints are. Those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ and keep the commandments of God. Those are the people of the church. It tells us also in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, it says, It was granted to him to make war with the saints, to come against them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So we see that the saints are still on the earth, and they are the ones who are in Christ Jesus. They are Christians and Jewish converts to Christianity. So we're told that the beasts represent kingdoms, and each of them will rise out of the sea of humanity. These four beasts represent the empire of the Antichrist. And it says that something interesting will happen. They will try to change times and laws. Now, last week, we did talk a little bit about how this is already happening in our society, that they don't want time marked by Christ. They want time to be generic. They want to call it, instead of uh, B.C., before Christ, or A.D., they want to call it common era, so that it is just blank. But you know what? We were told in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, that God is the only one who can change times and seasons. And what happened is the enemy is angry, and he is going to try to mimic God, and he is going to try to change the times and the seasons. And he's going to come on the scene, and he's going to say, well, we have to change this because we don't want to offend other faiths. So it's going to be like a diplomatic move. It's going to be a move of political correctness. And we see that climate in our world right now. It's being set up that people will accept this. And I believe when they're speaking of changing the times, that they're speaking of changing history. You see, they want to rewrite history. They want to exchange the truth for a lie. God tells us that they want to change the truth for a lie. And they're already doing it in our universities. Do you know in our universities in America, America is the bad guy. They're a thug. They're a thug out in the world. We're bad. America is bad in our universities. Matter of fact, in Texas, the history books are being changed. This is a headline. History speak, historians speak out against proposed Texas textbook changes. Historians on Tuesday criticized proposed revisions on the Texas social study curriculum, saying that many of the changes are historically inaccurate and that they would affect textbooks and classrooms far beyond the state's borders. The curriculum plays down the role of Thomas Jefferson among the Founding Fathers, questions the separation of church and state, and claims that the U.S. government was infiltrated by communists during the Cold War. They also want to change the foundation of our nation from being Judeo-Christian beliefs to saying that, no, we are not founded on that. It says, historians say the Founding farm Fathers had a variety of approaches to religion and faith. Some, like Jefferson, were quite secular. These are the kind of things that they want to put in the textbook. What is really interesting is that the textbook market in Texas is one of the largest in our nation. They have 4.7 million students. So what happens when Texas buys these school books is they skyrocket in the market and it decreases the cost of this textbook. So now when other states go to buy their curriculum, they're going to go to the le less costly textbook and buy that instead. So it's going to go all over our nation, this false history. Well, that's very important, but I think what's even more important is they're trying to change the history of Israel. 
they are trying to change it so that Israel cannot claim the Holy Land. This is from the Daily Wire, and it is titled, Why Does UNESCO Insist on Rewriting Israel's History? The process of international delegitimization began by the Arab world, and they are seeking the help of the UN members. They have systematically attempted to erase Jewish history in Israel for the sole purpose of rendering Israel's existence just one long occupation based on historical fabrications. The question isn't why the Arab world is engaging in such profu profuse insanity, but rather why is the rest of the Western world going along with it? Now that was written in 2016, and I have to say I am very proud of our president and of the White House for making a stand and acknowledging Israel and bringing the embassy to Jerusalem. I'm very proud of that and I'm proud of our president and our country for doing that. It says that the times and the laws are going to be changed and we have watched as our laws have been manipulated, the system has been manipulated and so many unholy laws have come into play. Laws like abortion, same-sex marriage, the ruling that the Bible is hate speech. Do you know in Canada, the Supreme Court ruled that you cannot quote the Bible because it is hate speech. That happened in 2013. And we are having our own difficulties here in California with AB 2943. And this bill prohibits every individual, whether a pastor, a clergy, alert, a licensed therapist, from advertising, offering to engage in, or engaging in sexual orientation change what's on the books to be passed. That, that if people come for help, they can't even get the help that they want. But I believe that the most important law that we need to keep in mind is the law of the Lord. And throughout the wor world, the law of the Lord is being exchanged for the exact Islamic law known as Sharia law. The Sharia law is extremely prominent in the Muslim countries and in places of high Muslim population. It seems that the Muslim people do not want to integrate with the law of the land where they're occupying. Matter of fact, in Britain, there are, where there's a very high population of Muslims, one of the headlines reads this, 22 secret Islamic courts are issuing rulings under strict Sharia law in the Midlands. It's happening. They're taking over and they're, they're, they're doing their own law system. Anyway, it says that this Antichrist is going to speak pompous words against the Most High. Well, just as I said, there have been many Antichrists already, and Mussolini is a picture of one of these Antichrists. As a young man, he proclaimed himself to be an atheist and several times tried to shock his audience by calling on God to strike him dead. He believed that science had proven that there is no God and that the historical Jesus was an ignorant man-man. He considered religion a disease of the psyche. Where have we heard that in our society today? We heard that on The View. Joy Behar called Christianity a psychological disease. And he also accused Christianity of promoting resignation and cowardice. Mussolini made attacks on Christianity, on the Catholic Church, and he made the most provocative remarks about communion and about a love affair between Christ and Mary Magdalene. Matter of fact, Mussolini had a creed that he had the school children recite. And in this creed, he proclaims that his God is Rome. And this is what the creed says. I believe in Rome eternal, the mother of the fatherland and Italy, her firstborn, who was born of a virgin womb by the grace of God, small g. 
who suffered under the barbarian invaders was crucified, slain, and buried, who descended into the sepulcher and rose from the dead in the 19th century, who ascended to heaven in her glory in 1918 and 1922 by the march of Rome, who is seated at the right hand of Mother Rome, who will come hence to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the genius of Mussolini, in our Holy Father fascism, and in the communion of its martyrs, in the conversion of the Italians, and in the resurrection of the empire. Amen. That was the creed of Mussolini. And I believe when the Antichrist comes, he's going to have a similar creed. He's going to want the allegiance of every human being. He is going to be, want to be worshipped like God. He is going to denounce the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is going to leave all believers open to great persecution. And that's what the next verse says. That the Antichrist shall persecute the saints of the Most High. In the King James Version, it actually says this. That the Antichrist shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That means there is going to be a steady stream of tribulation that will wear out the saints. And this will happen, it says, for time, times, and a half a time. And this is explained in Daniel chapter 4, 16. It is three and one half years or 42 months. This is the last three and a half years of the tribulation period known as the great tribulation and we know it's the great tribulation because Jesus defines it as the great tribulation in Matthew he says there will be a great tribulation so the saints are going to be handed over to the Antichrist for this short period of time and God actually intervened and shortened this period of time this means that God made the great tribulation a short period of three and a half years because of his saints because he didn't want his saints to endure more than that because he knew the plan of the enemy and the plan of the enemy is to wear us out remember how we started with this need to be strong and content in Christ we need to be strong and content in Christ because as time progresses it is going to get harder and harder to live for the Lord because this world and the enemy is going to try to wear us down. But we must stand strong for God. You know, as we go through this, this is really some troubling stuff. But God tells us in the book of Isaiah, he says that he will keep those in perfect peace whose minds are stayed on the Lord because you trust in the Lord so we must trust in the Lord and there may be some people out there that are listening to this that don't know Jesus that don't trust in the Lord I ask that you would pray to the Lord we have all fallen short of the glory of God so ask Jesus to come into your life to save you from your own sin and to save you from the future that will unfold Heavenly Father, we come before your throne. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are a saving God, that you have shortened the time of the tribulation, Lord, that you will come and that the day will come where victory will be ours, Lord. It's already won. I just pray that you would make us strong and that we would stand for you, Lord Jesus. It is in your name that I pray. Amen. <laughs>